more quickly than usual, but not instantly. About two times out of five, people will let the healing work for a while and then stop it. And then everything else that you could think of would fill up the rest of that board. Sometimes people, when they come in, they want you to help them. Most of the time, there's an underlying issue that's going to prevent them from accepting even the healing of the best healer, the best physician, the best surgeon. I mean, you could have Jesus himself work on some people, and it wouldn't work. Because for some reason, they want that issue, they want that problem. I've worked with some people where the cancer went away, and they got depressed. Or the problem with the arthritis got better, and they got angry and upset. And we, then we had to work with the anger and upsetness. And then the arthritis came back, and they started to get rid of the anger, and then we had to go through this cycle. And so healing is a complex business, because as humans, we don't always want what we ask for but we always seek what we truly need. And sometimes we need to struggle more than we need to heal. And as a healer, as a physician, I had to learn that. That sometimes when you're working with a client, often when you're working with a client, you need to find out where that client is so you can sit there with them and help them come to a place where they can have a good outcome. One of my greatest teachers, a Dr. Richard Smith at Einstein, said that Mitch, if you aren't referring away a third of your clients, you're treating too many people. Because at least a third of your clients don't want what you offer. They may say they do, but they don't really want to heal. We'll take one more question, then we'll move forward. It was really the same. I noticed that the people that you cured, or not you cured, but that were healed, all came to you and asked you for prayer. So there must have been some just like when Jesus, you know, when they came to him, it was by their faith, but they had some kind of reciprocal, uh, at least some kind of a paradigm shift or something that allowed them to come to you to ask for prayer in the first place. That right. was my question. Now, animals are better. When animals come to you, animals have a much better outcome, and plants are even better than animals. So humans, as when you look at the healing paradigm in humans, it's much more complex than in lower life forms. We complicate it by our desires and by the presence of our subconscious needs, which often outweigh the presenting needs that a person brings into you. When I work with my students that I have, I have about 150 students that I work with, it's one of the hardest things to teach a student, that you shouldn't work harder at healing a person than they do. That if a person comes into you with an issue and you find yourself calling them, pleading with them, making sure they keep their appointment, making sure they take whatever remedy you're working with, making sure they do their part of the healing Durrani, then they don't want to get better. And you have to accept that and move them on. Let's move forward just a little bit. <clears throat> so this model says that we're primarily made of energy and that this energy gives us intelligence. And this energy allows us to think and it allows us to react. It also allows us to organize matter so that matter can coordinate its own actions. We don't have to think about healing a cut when you get cut. It, the body just does it on its own. This healing energy has a consciousness to it that does its thing without you knowing anything about it. Occasionally through the use of prayer and sound, the body can act upon this energetic nature automatically or spontaneously. But where does the energy come from? How is it replenished? Does science have a model for an unknown source of energy that constantly enters the body and helps the body heal itself? Where does Ma get her energy? We can accentuate the energy, but where does it come from originally? In the year 1912, a scientist by the name of Victor Hess discovered something called primordial energy particles. Now, spiritually, this was an important discovery. He won the Nobel Prize for this discovery in the year 1936. Primordial energy particles constantly pour into this world every second. In this room, every second of every day, there are literally millions of particles striking us 
and everything around us, every minute of every day. Ancient spiritual teachers in many traditions have taught that there's energy coming into us from the spiritual world that we can learn to use as we evolve. And as we decipher the information in these particles, we can use it for our own higher growth and enlightenment. Ancient Taoist texts, ancient Shinto texts, and a number of other texts, ancient texts, say that the earth is constantly bathed in this sacred primordial energy, and that only as humans evolve spiritually can they begin to decipher this energy. The Tao teaches that this energy is the blueprint for life in the universe, and that this energy constantly bathes us and is constantly being emanated from the source. And modern man is only now understanding that there is energy that comes into our world, there is energy that our body absorbs, and there is energy that at the unconscious level we may begin to use. Science now teaches us that this energy is composed of high energy particles. We don't really understand where they come from. But we do know that they, everywhere you look you can find them. And they strike the earth at nearly the speed of light and when they hit the earth they interact with the particles in the earth's atmosphere and they change their speed, etc. But a lot of them end up hitting the human body. The interesting thing about them, really interesting, is that every molecule, every atom you can think of comes into our atmosphere, into our body from space. This includes gold, sodium, hydrogen. Every element, and even some elements we can't, don't even have names for yet, bombard your body every second. Also, high energy positrons, high energy electrons, and also subatomic particles. As a matter of fact, every time we try to examine the particles, we find more different types of particles. The interesting thing about the particles is that they've been hitting us for literally billions of years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every second of every day, 10,000 of these particles strike your body. The energy of these particles is higher than anything mankind can generate. We can't make the energy of these particles in a laboratory. The energy that hits us is higher than what our science can create. But remember, energy equals information. Primordial particles carry more energy and more information than anything we can measure. Some scientists believe that primordial cosmic rays have had an effect on the evolution of mankind. In the last million years, mankind has gone from one type of individual, one type of creature, to a man or individual with higher brain capacity, larger skulls, larger forehead, larger prefrontal uh, lobe areas. One thing that occurs in each one of these jumps is you can measure through certain scientific techniques, the background radiation surrounding the, the growth of this individual, you can find that there was more primordial radiation hitting the earth between this person and this person than it was right here. So that whenever the increase of primordial radiation happens in this earth, we grow. Mankind evolved. And the last time that happened was about 150,000 years ago. And man's brain changed significantly. Ancient Kabbalists and Taoists and Shinto priests teach that the human body can store this cosmic radiation. They even have a model for it. They say that this energy can be used for healing and spiritual growth and for enlightenment. They say that the body can store vast amounts of this energy. According to Kabbalistic teachings, the first creation of God was a being called Adam Kadmon. Adam Kadmon was a being whose energy, or who was co composed primarily of energy. And the energy settled itself into ten different areas of that being, and those areas were called the Sephiroth. You might recognize that as a tree of life. But there's a different way to understand this tree of life when you look at spiritual healing energy and the human body. Because remember, we're all based upon the same energy template as this original 